Welcome everybody to Slow Art Friday. I'm Paige Taylor, the Learning and Engagement Assistant, and I'm joined today by Barbara Pressman, our touring docent. Um, participants' microphones and videos are muted by default. Um, as you participate today, please ch choose a quiet room and silence uh, alerts from devices. Try not to sit in front of a strong light source. Use headphones and microphone for best sound quality and use a desktop, laptop, or tablet for the best viewing quality. Make sure that your screen name includes your first name and last name or first name and last initial. To ask questions or make comments, you can unmute your microphone, type in the chat box, or raise your hand. And as you were just reminded, um, we are recording our session today, so if you prefer not to be part of the recording, um, you're welcome to mute your mic or turn your video off and participate through the chat box. Each Friday at 12 p.m., docents lead virtual interactive conversations about a few artworks in our collection or special exhibitions. The goal is simple. Slow down, discover the joy of looking at art, and talk about the experience with others. For today's program, Barbara will lead us in an interactive conversation about four artworks from a special exhibition. We'll spend about 15 minutes or so with each artwork. Barbara will allow us time to look at each artwork on our own slowly yeah, before leading a conversation about each one with questions. As participants, we encourage you to engage in dialogue with Barbara, myself, and each other. Um, Barbara, what are we going to be talking about today? Well, today we're going to be talking about the exhibition called Old World, New Soil. And um, it's adjacent to uh, the Lewis Hine humanist uh, photographs. And he began his career by photographing immigrants. And all of these artists that are in this collection, um, in this exhibition, are immigrants who were born in another country and came to the United States to continue their career. Um, when I took my tours to the um, Heinz Museum, everybody was, Heinz exhibit, everyone was saying, well, what happened to those people? Where do they go on to? That my grandfather was there, my grandmother is here. So today we're gonna to be looking at four artists. There are con different concepts of the United States. One is it's a melting pot, which was I think more popular years ago. And it meant that people who immigrated just assimilated into America and became Americans and functioned um, as Americans and left their old culture behind. A more, um, more recent and probably maybe more accurate for some people, maybe not all, is this salad where each individual culture retains its culture and its background and thank goodness it's food because of the diversity of wonderful foods we have here in the United States. And the salad dressing is what holds us together as Americans. So when you're looking at these artworks, I would like you to be thinking about it, salad or melting pot. So we're gonna be looking at four different artworks and I would like, there of course, no wrong or right answers. And I would like you to look at them very carefully and uh, we'll have, we'll, hopefully we'll have, have a excellent discussion. Okay, I'm going to give you a few minutes to take a look at this. What's going on in this artwork? Unmute yourself and raise your hand, please. And a page, if you would really uh, look at the, uh, that, that's look at the chat for me. Um, I see a funeral, um, a, a burial taking place at, uh, after a funeral. And um, 
People are, are distraught by what's going on. And I think what's interesting in the picture is the, the American flag um, placed by the what looks to me like the headstone. So maybe this is a foreign born person who became an American citizen and that citizenship became very um, important to them and that's why they put the flag there. Okay, so Betsy has observed quite a few things. She's observed that it's a funeral and that the people are distraught and the significance of the, uh, of flag, of the flag there. And I think she pretty much told us why she said that. And um, is there any else, anyone else who has some comment? As it to almost looks like there's two flags there. If you look like Betsy said at the headstone, the one in the foreground, yes, right. That looks like mm -hmm. another flag to me too. I don't know the significance of the two flags, but it does look to be flanked on either side of the headstone. Oh there. yeah, I see. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of struck by the colors. Um, you can see the mountains in the sky and the trees and greenery in the back. And then there's just so many colors in here with the reds and the greens and the blues and the blacks and the grays and the whites. And it really makes it a very dramatic um, picture for me. Something that I noticed is the person who appears to be reading from some kind of book or booklet. Um, is is a preacher there is not a priest there is not an uh i'm in there, uh, this is mm -hmm. this is a group of protestant folks and they appear to be also i would say based on the way that they're dressed working people they're they're wearing their best attire notice that there aren't any fancy ties or cravats or anything like that uh, but but they are dressed nicely Okay. They so, all appear to be male to me. I can't tell. There may be one woman in the one background. Woman. No, there, I see two. I see one on each side of the central figure in the background. And, and maybe a third next to her. To her, yeah, that could be a woman too. And if you look um, at the picture, the colors are red, white, and blue. Um, the color of the flag, many of yes. them. Oh, many of the people are wearing shades of red, white, and blue. And mm -hmm. um, I yeah. believe it was Laurel or Billy that mentioned also that they look like they were dressed in their best clothes. And mm -hmm. um, Laurel said that they were very colorful. And now we're saying that they're red, white, and blue. Um, mm -hmm. So they've all made some connections with the colors as far as funeral attire uh, is concerned. I, I would kind of wonder how we would interpret this if we had not opened it up with the idea that these are immigrants or that we were even addressing that subject matter. You okay. know, it's like it's, uh, if we were just looking at this as a crowd of people at a funeral without thinking of that beforehand, we might interpret this slightly differently. And, and how, what would you, how would you interpret it differently? Well, I wouldn't necessarily think that they were foreigners. Uh, I would think that maybe uh, those American flags were their nationality. Um, and, um, you know, they, it is interesting that they're, they, they all do look like they're white, perhaps. Yeah. There doesn't seem to be a lot of other representations in that group. Okay. Doris? Okay. Um, the, in, in answer to uh, the gentleman's question, I think also, or comment, um, I, which I agree with, um, that um, I, I, another explanation for the flags could be that it's a burial of a veteran. Sure. Yeah. That's true. And, and I did say the artist came from another country. I didn't say that the, the subject matter was from another country. So, I Angela, think. did you have a comment? Yeah, regardless of, you know, whatever country they came from, I think the, the way that they're positioned, the way that they're so close, really evokes for me what happens when a family loses someone. I mean, they could be scattered all over the, the place, they could have issues among them, but when there's a death, they're all drawn together in their grief and their memories, and, and that's what really resonated with me about all of them clustered so tightly around the grave. Mm -hmm. 
And, mm -hmm. and I, I just like to say that because I don't see anyone wearing any kind of garment that indicates that they are Native American, that mm -hmm. we're all immigrants. And these folks are all immigrants of one time at, from one time or another. That's true. There are no indigenous uh, representatives or and any, well, there could be indigenous, but they may not be in native dress. So yes, I, I agree with that. Yeah, I'm slow Friday right now, so I can't talk to you. And I have. Uh -oh. <laughs> Anyone else? Anyone? Does anyone know what the green four things are in the front? Um, like if you go from the flag and then there's something to the left and there's like three or four of them, are those plants or I don't know, somebody's feet? Like, okay. I don't know. Any, any ideas about what they could be? Does anyone like, have any idea? Look like plants of some sort. But I have a question about what's in the preacher's hand. Okay. His right hand. Ah. Yeah. Any any ideas about what that could possibly be? Anybody have any any ideas? Looks like a handkerchief to me. <laughs> a folded white handkerchief. Yeah, and it's so bulbous, it looks like a bag. Yeah, it looks like he's Maybe. holding... Oh, something. the bag. Oh, I'm sorry. In the front. Yeah. yeah, it looks like a bag. No, in, I'm not as familiar with this part, but uh, in Jewish religions, don't they stack stones? Or is that in all funerals? Do they stack stones at the um, grave? There could be a bag full of stones or something. Well, that, that's true. Uh, in a Jewish religion, uh, they usually leave a stone on visiting the grave, but maybe at the funeral. I've never heard of it at the funeral, but that could possibly be. It could be a cultural thing, maybe. Well, whatever's in the bag. I don't know. I'm not really sure. Um, on the other hand, we're driven. I'm driven. We didn't, In those days, they didn't have plastic bags. And that kind of looks like a plastic bag. And you're saying in those days, what about this uh, artwork makes you think it's not these days and it's those days? The clothing. Okay. And what mm -hmm. time period would you think it might be? It's, it's 1930s or before. Okay. And what makes you, oh, you, you said the clothing makes you think. Yeah. That. Okay. Does anybody have any idea what the location of this place might be? It looks it looks to me like somewhere in Appalachia with the mountains in the background. Okay. The Blue Ridge, yes. Blue Ridge. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is the first thing that catches your eye about this? What was the first thing that drew you into this um, artwork? Yes, Doris. For me, I, it was the, um, it looks like a younger, like a boy or a younger man in the center holding mm -hmm. what looks like a shovel. I guess he might have been a grave digger or something, just because he was so much right in the middle. And then my eye went kind of up to the face um, above him, and then it kind of triangulates out. Like, I think the composition is really interesting. Um, mm. Everyone is crowded together, and it just seems like there's a lot of angles and diagonals going on. Anyone else? Mm. What more can we yeah, that gentleman in the center that you just pointed out uh, with the full face and the white shirt really is right above him. Um, is like he's the pinnacle point it seems and then the other people are going in this triangular or diagonal, their heads going a diagonal at either side of him so it's I do find my eye going to him, plus he's the kind of the brightest with the white shirt. Okay. Do you think that has any significance for the artist? I think that you, when you're seeing that face straight on, all the other faces are kind of uh, not as uh, well-defined, I guess. Um, so I, I imagine that that character has some significance. Okay. 
Does anyone else feel that way about that? Uh, yes, Eleanor? You have to unmute yourself. Mute yourself. Um, it just, for me, it's more the sum of the faces and in a oval and that they're very, very evocative in terms of the emotion that the artist has captured. I, I really appreciate the comments someone made about how drawn together they are. Mm -hmm. That there's a real sense of unity among all of these figures. Just not physically close, but you can almost feel a spiritual kind of unity. Mm -hmm. I agree. Right. There is the one lady on the back row with her two hands up at her face, and she seems to be maybe perhaps the mother, because she's seems to be a little bit more emotionally distort than the rest of them. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I thought um, to me it was very interesting, and I know that the, there is a variety of distraughtness in each of their faces. I think that mm -hmm. the um, the artist has anyone has anyone else observed that that there was different degrees of anguish or or uh, feeling i wouldn't i wouldn't say degrees um to me it just seems like people mourn in different ways you know some are more i'm going to suck it up and I feel terrible, but I can't express it. And then the woman in the background obviously is is weeping. Um, the man in the middle is very stoic. He's almost, I saw him almost as like the patriarch of the mm. group. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, I, I don't see it as degrees of grieving. I just see it as methods or, you know, ways of grieving. Mm -hmm. Do you think the artist is trying to express some part of his life? through this painting, through this artwork? I don't know. Sarah, did you have a, a, another yeah, comment you I, wanted to make? Yeah, just to follow up on the fact that they are so uh, close together and looking down at the, the grave site, it seems to me that probably the person being buried was a very pivotal person in the life of this group of people probably the glue that held everybody together. That's the idea I get from how they're standing and looking down and the fact that they are so close together. This is an important person that they've lost. Mm -hmm. I also oh. think that um, since we all recognized, it seemed to be anyway from the comments right away that this represents a, a burial, that this, um, um, this is um, something that is universal, this, this grief and, um, um, and this particular um, point in, in, in life, um, regardless of the time that it took place or where it was that we can all, um, it's, a, it's a feeling, that feeling of grief we can all share. I, I agree with you, Doris. I think uh, it is a universal uh, experience and we've all uh, mentioned the closeness of the family and the fact that we thought this was a pivotal person in their life. And now I'd like you to think about my initial question. Does this seem, I, Gary already mentioned that if I hadn't mentioned that it was a, uh, an artist who came from another country, is there anything that anybody else observed about this that might make it seem or makes it seem like it might be from another country? Has the artist put a stamp of his nationality or origins in this? Hmm. No? Yeah. So is that a resounding no? <laughs> <laughs> I was just gonna say to follow what Dara said, I was attracted also to the center young boy, the grave digger, if you will. But it looks to me like the gentleman to the left of him may be trying to say something to him or get his attention by touching his arm. The other side. Yeah, my other leg. No. Yeah, that gentleman. Yeah, that he's almost like touching the boy or trying to say something to him. 
plus it looks like a lot of people have something in their hand. Um, I don't know, there's something green in the forefront there, the guy on the right, and then to his right, maybe a handkerchief or something. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, all, they all look like they're carrying something and whether it's something mm -hmm. to, put, to put on the grave or just to have with them, I, I don't know. Oh, now she looks like a woman. Now the woman in between the grave digger and this gentleman, this looks like, definitely looks like a woman close up like that. Right. And, uh, are that grave like diggers? Go ahead. Well, who is speaking? Gary, go ahead. Uh, it, it would be interesting if that grave digger were not lowered down and he was standing upright like everybody else, we would have a whole different kind of composition going on. So I think it's yeah. interesting that, he, that he's crouched down like that. And the person behind him, I don't think would look as significant if that grave digger was standing up tall. Okay. So you feel that the fact that he's crouching down is, uh, was used by the artist to bring attention to the man standing above him. To me, it almost feels like a, a snapshot, like when you get a family group together and you're like, everybody line up and get a photograph and George in the front, you stoop down a little bit, you know, so it has a kind of a snapshot in it. And I don't mean to lighten the subject matter by using that example, but it does seem like a, a, it's a snapshot of time, but the positioning of him feels like he's been, like he's trying to let that person be seen. Okay, well, let's uh, go to the information slide. We really got a lot of information out of this. I really like the discussion. So this is called Funeral by Pierre Dora. Uh, and it was done in 1941 to 1945. So maybe whoever mentioned, I didn't read about it, but it could be the funeral of a uh, war veteran because of the flags. It's oil on canvas board and it's uh, 32 by 25. And it's one of the first um, paintings that you see when you walk into that gallery. And it's quite um, impactful because just the, uh, the feeling. But uh, Pierre Dora was a really interesting uh, artist. He was, um, he was born in, oh, and I don't have the dates of his work, in 19... 1896 in, um, I think, believe in Barcelona, no, Mallorca, Spain, and he was raised in Barcelona, and this, I thought, was one of uh, the more interesting facts about him. He went to school in, um, in Barcelona, and his teacher was Picasso's father. Now, you know, Picasso's father was a very classical painter, and so that's where he got his initial, um, mm. his initial training but then he also went to Paris he also was in a group he did show at the salon you remember the salon where everybody was supposed to be executive and then he was rejected and showed outside of the salon um he was important in a group called Circ in the square it's called circle in the square which is a very modern group that didn't get a lot of attention at the time but later on was considered significant. He, he fought in the war and after the war he uh, was injured and he lost his, his citizenship and he married, oh, when he was in Paris he married an American and he moved to Virginia and he lived there for most of his life. So um, I he also studied in Paris so I, I feel like you can see kind of, um, well anyway I was going to ask you now that you know his background is there anything else you want to say? Is there anything else that you can observe from this that might, uh, that's changed because you know his background? Um, I, I'm trying to remember when Guernica was painted. And I think it was like 19, late 1930s. So once you said that he came from Barcelona, that's the Catalonian area. Um, I can see the colors and I can see that area since I've been to it coming into this painting. So you can see his 
Spanish background through the colors. The and Catalonian background. Okay. Very different from the, the Spanish, but that region where the mountains, you know, they're important. And during 19, and uh, I see the, now it seems like the flags would be um, military honoring. Someone has died and has been fighting in the military. Yeah. I could see that that would be with, with the, um, that period of time. Hmm. That's would true. be relevant to him culturally. Right. But he lived in the United States from 1937 till his death. So he was in the United States a very, very long time. But he still has the influence of uh, his background, I think. To me, mm -hmm. it does. Anyway. Anybody else have anything interesting here? Okay, then let's go on to our next slide. I'll give you a few minutes to look at it. I'm going to start this one off with what is the first thing that you notice in this artwork? It looks to be a small, tiny church, and there's a storm in the sky brewing. Okay. I see the church door. It's the first thing I see. Mm. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask Paul one way. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just agreeing with Billy. I, that door is so white and bright and welcoming. Uh, Yes, it is. And I was going to ask, uh, Laura, what did what makes you think there's a storm coming? What do you see that makes you think there's a storm coming? Well, it looks to me to be the clouds and the way the, the, the colors, the grays and the dark and the movement. Um, it just it, it doesn't look like a calm, sunny day. It looks like there's a storm coming. But as I'm looking at it too, I noticed the red and the orange at the bottom right there by the little, what look like basement windows almost. And up at the top, there's just a tiny little bit of red up mm. there, orange color to balance it out. Mm -hmm. And I'm also noticing the absence of um, animals, people, cars. It, it's just, just the church there. The church is sitting on a hilltop and the sky is very angry. Okay. Do you think the, uh, what mood is the uh, artist trying to portray with this artwork? Almost like salvation in the middle of the storm. Oh, interesting. So the, the, the uh, church would be a place of salvation and uh, sanctity and safety in the storm. Yes, Doris, you had something to say? Well, I thought it, it looked, the whole thing looked foreboding to me. Um, there seemed to be this storm and you have this, this church that's just sort of standing all alone there. And it, it, is there some meaning in terms of um, whatever was going on at the time that this was painted and maybe some threat um, to churches? I don't know. <laughs> so so is, uh, what is it you see that makes you say it's foreboding? Um, the sky, the, 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 the storm, um, I might be maybe trying to read too much into it, but um, it just, um, but, you know, and then hearing the other comment about, well, the church is, could be, you know, sort of this, the sanctuary um, in a storm, that makes sense to me as, as well. But my first reaction was that this was um, foreboding. Carol commented in the chat that the door is locked. Uh-oh. So maybe we can there. take a look. Maybe here, Carol, I don't know if this is what you were talking about with this, the handle kind of looks like it's over the opening of the door maybe. Actually, I didn't write that. Um, it said Carol. Mm -hmm. I know it does, but I didn't write that. Oh, okay. Well, somebody commented uh, yeah. that the door is locked, doesn't look friendly. Is there anybody who said Carol that? Carol Smith here. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't think, I think there's know. another Carol Smith. I see two names with Carol Smith. Oh. Huh. Carol, are you logged in twice, perhaps? No, uh, two Carol Smiths. Oh, no, there are two Carol Smiths. Um, Christy oh. is, is commenting. That's funny. Uh -huh. So one of the Carols commented <laughs> about the locked door. Yeah. It, it doesn't look like a welcoming um, place <laughs> to me. It, it looks like something almost gothic, you know, um, foreboding and frightening. Okay, and what makes you say that? What do you see that makes you feel that it's frightening? <laughs> because the, of the pitch of the roof, it reminds me of, of you know, uh, cartoons and, and um, depictions of, of houses that look kind of like this that are, are haunted. I mean, the fact that there's nobody there, I don't get a sense of um, welcoming or warmth. Um. It definitely looks American. You know, uh, you don't see these types of churches anywhere else, particularly, especially made out of wood, but you like if you were in Sandy Mush or any of those other little neighborhoods, you see these little churches quite a lot. Or if you travel around uh, the south of America, um, so it definitely has a, a placement. I thought it looked like Sleepy Hollow the minute we laid eyes on it. Haunted and in a storm, isolated and unfriendly. Yeah, you know? that's kind of how I felt too, Linda. I know, I caught that. That's typical for us, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, so do you think that the art, uh, artist is expressing an opinion upon about religion or churches? I would say it's about the religion in the, like Carl mentioned, the door is closed. You know, uh, I said earlier it was white and welcoming. I guess if it was really welcoming, the door would be open. So uh, mm -hmm. maybe it's saying that, you know, uh, if it's not Sunday, this place is not accessible to you. Plus the stairs don't look like they'd be very easy to navigate at all. They're, they're not quite broken, but there's no handrail and um, they kind of look chipped a little. Might be very hard to get up those stairs. Mm -hmm. it, it also it seems to me as if it might be in disrepair. <clears throat> if you take a look at the door, and then you take a look at those two square objects that look like gates or something. They almost look like they're falling in on themselves. So this may be a, a, an empty, abandoned church. Mm. I'm thinking the same thing, Sarah. Sandy, Sandy mentions in the chat that the bushes and the golden ground remind her of Van Gogh. I would agree. I almost think the sky look, reminds me of Starry Nights a little bit. Um, it's obviously not rendered as much as Starry Nights, but, and that's, when I kind of think of that, I don't think of Starry Nights as being something that's um, got any sinisterness to it. So I, I, I don't really find the sky to be um, sinister in that sense. Okay, so you don't find it to be sinister, it's just a normal cloudy storm coming your way. Um. Uh, yeah, kind of. I, 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 when I look at it, I, it feels kind of like a, it feels like Starry Nights. Um, and I don't really associate Starry Nights with something that is sinister. So I'm, I keep superimposing Starry Nights on that kind of background. Eleanor comments in the chat that um, she gets the feeling that the church could be kind of hunkered down during the storm. Oh. That's interesting, Eleanor. So that kind of agrees with uh, Jackie's idea that it's a place of salvation or a place to, uh, to shelter in a storm or that it's battened down for the coming of the storm. Those kind of interesting ideas. I, um, someone had mentioned that it looked abandoned and in disrepair. Is there anybody else who, who sees anything that makes them feel that way? Yes, Carol? Carol? I don't, uh, to me, it's this church itself seems sinister, almost like out of an Edgar Allan Poe poem. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so not this so much the storm behind it, the oncoming storm, but 
just the uh, the drawing of the church itself. Um, I know someone said it's typical of American um, types of Protestant churches, which I agree, but it just, yeah, the church itself is what's giving me the eerie feeling. Yeah. I, I see it as kind of enduring. Obviously, it's quite a an older vintage church, um, and it's been through probably several generations. And despite this storm, there have probably been many, many other storms that it, it stayed upright through all this time. Um, and I don't think it's neglected, really, because the, the grounds around it, you don't see a lot of, um, you know, grass growing up around the... Um, the entrance and so on. So I, I saw it so, sort of as a place of refu refuge waiting for anyone who would like to come there. And, and I think very often people do that. They turn to religion in times of, of struggle and darkness, which that sky to me represents. Do you think the, uh, off, uh, the artist's choices of color affects the feeling that you get about this artwork? Yes, sure. Yes, I do. It's almost like it's saying repent now, like mm -hmm. it, it, it's coming and uh, go now and repent. Okay, so if it was a sunny blue sky, would, um, what would it say to you? It says to me, you are alone. Ooh. Sorry. Then. Although Sandy said in the chat that she would like owning this artwork um, because she loves the colors and the isolated church. I also think there's a yin and a yang here because of the darkness of the sky, but then the brightness of the door. I, I don't see it as a dismal, scary sight. Good. All right. So we have people who see different things. It's great. Eleanor? Well, I'm just thinking, um, this reminds me so much of driving through some of the more rural areas around us and seeing these small churches and thinking I would love to be inside them and experience how they're expressing themselves in terms of how they worship and how they see the world, but knowing that I would be um, not particularly a, a welcome outsider and how that would be portrayed, but kind of wishing I could experience what these small rural churches, um, their lives, which are often very much wrapped up in their churches and religious observances. Wow, I think we've gotten a lot of really great feedback on a lot of different ideas from foreboding to welcoming to, you know, a lot of good stuff. So let's look at the, um, the information slide. And the title. Uh, I can't I hear you. I mentioned that I went online to look at uh, Daura and he actually went back to Spain to fight. Um, in the uh, Catalonian civil, the civil war between Franco and the Catalonians. So he was there and he would have partaken in the period of time when Guernica was painted. He, you know, he was injured actually in battle in the early forties. I, I think I said that he was injured and that he didn't want to re fight again and he was asked to leave. And so right, and then because it was Franco and he was Catalonian, he was, you know, he was um, not, his Spanish citizenship was revoked. Right. That was all that era, that terrible era when the painters in Catalonia changed their styles and their perspectives and how they painted. Well, thank you. I try not to give too much, too much and go on and on. But anyway, I do want to talk about this uh, and, get, and gather we all together. Interesting title. Um, and the author, I mean, the artist is a woman, Betty Waldo Parrish, circa 1950. And it's 20 by 15 by seven eight. So it's not a tremendous painting. And um, this lady uh, was born in Germany 
uh, I'm not going to give you a great deal of information, but she came to the United States as a young child right before World War I. So uh, people who observed that it looked like an American church, probably she had more influence from America than um, Germany. And um, she did study at the Fine Arts School of Chicago. And then she moved to New York and was in the Art Artist Student League. She went to the Grand Central School of New York City and she did study at the Julian uh, in Paris. She um, was also, I like this, she was a member of the National Association, Association of Women Painters. She's known as an Ashcan uh, artist and she was uh, very famous for her etchings and she's shown in many galleries uh, throughout the United States. She did get to be uh, quite famous. Um, so I thought that was interesting. And knowing about her, has that changed your idea or what she mm -hmm. might be like? Anything about the artwork? I think the title definitely softens the piece. Uh, that idea of us all gathering together, uh, which, yeah, definitely softens it. Yes, it takes that foreboding out a little bit. If she didn't see it, that foreboding. Um, or or perhaps the title is intended to be irony. Mm hmm Sure. There's many ways to look at it. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you all taken away from it something different. And uh, that's that's what our great artwork is all about. So next Can slide. I make one comment? Sure. Um, the, the lady that spoke earlier about wanting to um, see maybe the insides of these and join in. Um, I know that in Sandy Mush right now, they're because of COVID, they're holding all of their services outside. So a lot of these churches have become more accessible because you can just pull into the parking lot in your car and the, they, they present it out in the parking lot. So you don't actually get into the building, but you do get to protect. We listen to them every Sunday from our garden. So um, you can actually uh, get access to a lot of these churches right now that you wouldn't have normally. Oh. Yeah, I, I understood what, okay, go ahead, Betsy. Oh, I wasn't going to, I think that's very interesting um, and to know that, and it would be a fascinating experience to, and feel maybe more welcome <laughs> that way rather than trying to get in physically into a church. We've, we've loved it and we're not that way inclined at all, but just hearing their uh, hymns and yeah. uh, offerings yeah. uh, come up through the field is so beautiful. Yeah. I, I would enjoy that. Okay. Well, interesting. I also feel the same way, Eleanor. I'd like to go in some of those churches as well. Okay, let's take a few minutes to look at this artwork. Okay. Does anybody have any? Ooh. What's going on in this artwork? What's your, what catches your eye about it? It looks to be a, a teapot. Um, I really like this piece. Um, the handle, um, the shape of the handle as it goes up and uh, the coloring on the handle is intriguing to me. And just a lot of the, the colors, with, uh, they're muted in a way, but they're blue and green and black and white and sort of yellow tinge. I just say the colors and the shape. So you're drawn to it by the color and the shape, and it's especially the handle used that. Mm. And what's it about the handle that is especially intriguing to you? Well, the way, uh, the actual shape that it's not perfect. I mean, it kind of, uh, if you start from the bottom where it's adhered there and it kind of, uh, curves a little in and out and the way the colors go up to the top it just uh, and it balances the spout on the other side so it just it's just kind of nice and yeah. again, again following up on that imperfect theme it looks like there are two like chunks or chips taken out of the bottom um of the of the pot and it and it I, I love it for its its beauty, the color, the shapes, and um, but 
it doesn't look functional to me. It, it, I'd be afraid to put hot water in it. For some reason, it just looks like it might crack or something. It looks fragile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does anybody think it looks functional? I agree. It doesn't. It doesn't really look functional. But it, 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 sa it says to me that this is a piece that is cherished maybe by a family. You know, given your theme, and um, it reminds me of my immigrant grandparents who left me um, an espresso set, an Italian espresso set, and I have never used it. I've always just left it out because it's these teeny china cups with the little gold rims on it, but I cherish it just as perhaps, you know, whatever family might have this would cherish it as an, as an heirloom, an expression of their, their heritage. Um, I think Eleanor had something to say. Would you use it? I'm just, when you said functional, I thought you said sensual. And oh, <laughs> okay. my response, it just feels very sensual, like a very um, verdant woman with um, childbearing hips. <laughs> I don't know what. Oh, so maybe. there's something, you find the, uh, the shape of it to be feminine. <laughs> yes. You had some really interesting observations. Anyone else has something else to add? Does anyone else see something else in this piece? Well, the cutouts were made to create the illusion of feet. So the cutouts, I'm sure, continue all the way around the piece. Um, and to me, it does look functional because the, the clay is rather thick. It doesn't have the fine porcelain uh, delicacy. Uh, and it has a broad base. It also looks much more American or European than Asian because Asian teapots aren't, are, are not designed in this shape. So um, my first thought when I think of teapots is Asian for some reason. And then of course we drink tea all over the world. So this would be to me a European or American ceramic piece, not porcelain. <laughs> okay, very interesting. Anything else? I, we have another piece to look at, so I'm thinking maybe we should see the information about this piece, and then we can even talk about the artist. All right, this teapot is by Hiroshi Suyusaki, and it's glazed porcelain. It is porcelain, and um, it is. And you know, Hir Hiroshi is... Um, we moved here from Southport. Hiroshi is over in Southport. And that was a year that he did nothing but make teapots to perfect his ability to make teapots. Mm. Well, good. And, you know, um, I thought this piece was very mm -hmm. interesting because uh, Hiroshi uh, studied with, uh, and please, my Japanese pronunciation, uh, Soshi Ma Mata... Mm. So she, so, no, I can't, I can't say. Well, anyway, he was the Japanese potter of the Minger folk art in, in Japan. And um, Hiroshi was born in Japan and studied with him in, in the folk art um, movement in Japan. And when he was 25 years old, Soya told him that he needed to experience other cultures and he moved to Ashboro and then moved on to Wilmington. And um, he's done not only teapots, which I only has said she's seen, but he's done these giant sculptures that uh, I forgot the garden it was in, but I looked at the sculptures and they're really quite astounding and very, very beautiful. So he was, um, he was the featured artist and a declared a national treasure for the Cameron Museum in Wilmington. I was going to say that, Billy. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'll be quiet. <laughs> okay. It's okay, Billy, because I know you do your research and you know a lot. So that's well, I had the opportunity to study with him and he's, he is, mm -hmm. bless his heart. <laughs> he, like my husband, has uh, Parkinson's disease now and is experiencing all of the symptoms of Parkinson's. So he no longer works in ceramics, but uh, 
he was mm -hmm. truly, in my experience, a treasure to be able to just know and, and understand his theories and philosophies of art and ceramics. Yes, and they said that he, he started with his, his traditional background, but expanded and did many different kinds of uh, uh, thick wall vessels and abstracts and uh, sculptures. So, Here's a wonderful book of his work, uh, and I have a copy of it somewhere. If I come across it, I'll take it down to the museum, but it's, it's definitely worth seeing. Well, it sounds like it would be worth seeing, and I believe he's, he has, a, he's, has a, he's the artist, artist in residence in Cameron Art Museum, which I'm not sure where it is, but I believe it is in North Carolina, and he's a very it's in Wilmington. It's in Wilmington. The Cameron Museum is a museum very similar to our museum here um, in Wilmington, North Carolina. Well, that might be a nice place to go visit and check mm -hmm. out his artwork. Um, and uh, so now knowing about this artist, uh, somebody said it didn't look at all orient. Uh, it didn't I said that. Yes. Not knowing it was Hiroshi's. I said that because it doesn't have the traditional uh, delicate uh, look. Of, but if you think about Chunky and, and the teapots that I've made studying with Hiroshi, they were all solid. So my, I misspoke. No, you didn't. That's what it looked like to you. That's what it looked like to you. And I, I think um, also, what could you say about the design on it? Is it, is it a traditional uh, Japanese kind of design that you would find on traditional Japanese types of uh, of teapots, the art, the colors I, and the I, shapes. Yes, I yes. think that information that Billy shared with us earlier about that he spent that year experimenting. Uh, this looks very experimental to me, and with Billy's information, it kind of um, reinforces that idea because uh, he is reshaping the teapot and he is reshaping the handle and. The spout looks, usually the spout is kind of the delicate part and it looks kind of chunky. So it does feel experimental in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think so. and, Yeah, well, Betsy, you studied uh, Asian art for a while. Yeah, and, and imperfection is part of their aesthetic. I mean, that that is purposeful um, in their designs and, um, and ceramics and, and painting, um, yeah. So that everybody's said things that I think are actually right on. And I like the organic shape of it too, the kind of bulbousness of it, almost like it's a bud, you know, getting ready to flower or something. Yeah, Notice how feminine. perfectly the lid fits. Yeah. Yeah. I think it probably could be functional if you wanted to use it that way, but I don't think I would. Can we go to the next artwork? Because we only have a few minutes left for it. And I wanted to get to all of our artists. Give you a few minutes to look at it. <clears throat> okay, what's going on in this artwork? What's the first thing that catches your eye about this artwork? Oh, my internet is on the wire. I was noting the wire up at the top. I mean, it looks to me to be a model of a vessel. It's not in the water. It, it's um, and all of yeah, the, that white wire and up at the top is interesting to me. And what, what do you? What do you think the wire might signify? Hmm. Uh, Anybody? Could be right just figured on the sales. Yeah, I think maybe that. I don't know. I figured it was Anybody sort of a grounded. Sorry, go ahead. 
it's a grounded. Um, yeah, that, that it wasn't going anywhere, that it's maybe a, a boat that somebody lives in, you know, by a pier because it doesn't have any sails. It doesn't have any um, indication of a motor, but it does look like it has it inside with the window. So mm -hmm. I, I just saw it as a non-functional boat. Mm -hmm. Yes, Carol? It made me think of that it was something that a child could have made. Uh, just the way the uh, checkerboard part is painted to me, it seems very uh, done by a useful hand. Okay. So you think the checkerboard uh, indicates that it could have been done by a younger person? Well, I'm thinking a child, but I'm sure it's not. But that's, you know, my impression. Just the whole feeling of it to me. Eleanor? It feels a lot um, as if it's in the folk art tradition. Um, an artist who um, maybe later in life began to uh, paint and... Anyway, it just has has that folk art feel for me. And and what is it, what is it that makes you say that? What is it that makes you say that? Um, it's not. It's not. Um, I don't know how to say this without it sounding negative, but it doesn't feel refined. It's more um, conveying the feel of. Less, there's not a lot of specific details and it's not perfectly rendered. Um, mm -hmm. It's more evocative than a perfect um, okay. piece of sculpture. It seems it's more representative. Yeah. Oh, excuse me, go ahead. I'm sorry, more representative than real. And I don't know a lot about nautical stuff, but I don't know if this is military or commercial or a personal vehicle. It, it, it's just kind of interesting. Okay, sorry. All right, yeah, I, I was just thinking that it, it represents a feeling to the artist. You know, like Eleanor was saying, it's not really representational. It's a, a feeling of, of flight or of movement, especially if this person was an immigrant, you know, that they were fleeing something to come to the United States. Wonderful. Well, since we only have like a couple of minutes, let me show you the, uh, let's have Paige show us the uh, information. All right, this is Untitled by Hubert Walter, and you guys are so on it. Um, he is a self-taught artist who began much later on in life. He was born in 1931 in Jamaica in West Indies, and he came to the United, he, was, he worked as a commercial fisherman in Jamaica before he moved to New York in the 1970s, and um, he worked as a carpenter. And then he relocated to North Carolina and started doing a lot of what we call folk art. And I believe in our folk art um, exhibit that's on, on show at the museum, there's a, I'm not sure if it's a bear or a pig, I have a hard time deciding, but it's also by uh, Hubert Walter. And um, yes, he does use a lot of found objects and he uses wire and Bondo. And, um, and this is like using the black and white in the graphic is like his signature, uh, signature uh, colors that, that he uses. Um, so I, I thought it was interesting. I, I did also, when I looked at the uh, artworks, I wanted to represent um, as many different countries and cultures as I possibly could. Um, so I was gonna ask um, Paige to show us all four artworks. And I was gonna ask this question, um, more salad, keeping its own distinct um, cultural mm -hmm. background or more melting pot. Any piece that you'd like to comment being more of one or the other? Any ideas? Any? Hmm. He's very, I like his comments. Yeah. 
I, I know that um, I, I taught English to speakers of other languages and there were some groups of people who just really wanted to become American and there were other people who wanted to preserve their culture. Do any of these pieces seem to preserve their culture? I think the teapot definitely has the Japanese aesthetic um, to me. I think the first one is a melting pot because it's almost, because of the subject matter, it could be anywhere, anytime. And I, I also think that the idea of bringing culture from your other country with you is, uh, can often be misrepresented. You know, um, I, re I, I typically don't eat meat and I recently had sweet and sour chicken for the first time in 30 years. and. <laughs> It reminded me of my home in Ireland because that's, <laughs> and it was this nostalgic moment. And I was like, wow, when did that change happen? That I stopped identifying as Irish things. And it was actually something Chinese from Ireland that made me feel nostalgic for Ireland. Um, and I think a lot of immigrants go through that, that they might actually bring other cultures from their own country when they move that may not necessarily be uh, authentic to that country. Okay, that's, I hope that made uh, sense. <laughs> no, it's valid, and I really do be that that might be more like melting pot because we uh, find things from other cultures and uh, identify with them. Because I do love sushi and <laughs> other things like that from different cultures. Yes, Eleanor. It, it's hard for me to separate um, how subjectively. I see um, these objects from the artists. So I'm finding since my preference is to see us as, um, you know, sort of keeping the aesthetic of other cultures rather than melting pot. Um, but I know that that's such a strong um, bias of mine to wanna see that. So it's hard for me to separate myself. When, when you ask that question and to see these more objectively? Well, I think, I mean, I think it's a very subjective question. And I just asked it because I was wondering, since it was called Old World New Soil, I wanted to just discuss that, the possibility that um, were people Jamaican absorbed Jamaican. and absorbed into our culture or did they keep some of their... Um, uh, native uh, heritage. Anyway, thank you so much for all of your fabulous input. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Thank you to all my friends who showed up, and I appreciate <laughs> all, all the other regulars who are always here, and um, thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for selecting these artworks to share with us today, and thank you, everyone, for joining and making this a wonderful discussion yet again. Um, just a reminder, there is no Slow Art Friday next week on July 2nd um, because of the holiday, so I hope to see you all on July 9th as Doris will um, take us or lead us in a conversation um, with the theme Open to Interpretation. So uh, until then, have a wonderful week. Bye, everybody. Thank you.